War rages in Ukraine and in Gaza. An earthquake rocks Japan. Civil war explodes across several African nations. In California, a 10-year-old boy is shot and killed by his 10-year-old neighbor. Despite billions of dollars poured into efforts to halt them, drug overdose deaths are still on the rise. Violence is so prevalent in our culture that only the most horrific crimes are reported. Why? Why is our world such a mess? Why are human beings so violent and hateful toward one another? Why hasn't science, technology, psychology, education, or the government made any headway in these areas? I believe the answer to that question can be summarized in one sentence. The leaders in these areas have misdiagnosed the problem, therefore their solutions don't work. This brings me to another question, one we're going to consider for the next four weeks. Why church? As the world seems to be falling apart, the church seems to be slowly fading away. Church attendance and membership are declining in our culture. Local churches are closing in alarming numbers. Even Christian colleges and seminaries are closing their doors permanently. So the question comes, has the church become passé? A relic of the past has gone the way of rotary telephones and dial-up internet? My answer to that is a resounding no. No, we have not become irrelevant. The church of Jesus Christ is needed now as never before. In a culture that desperately needs love, and joy, and peace, and hope. We have it. We have the resources needed. But unfortunately, too many churches have lost sight of their identity, their power, and their purpose, and instead have adopted the world's ways of thinking and doing so that they can be more acceptable to the world. Thus they are going the way of the world, which being interpreted means they're going down the drain. Jesus spoke of the church in Matthew chapter 5, what we often call the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, he said, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Notice Jesus did not say you might be the salt of the earth, or if you want to be, you can be the light of the world. He said you are. That is what the church is. We are salt, we are light, and if we're not, we're worthless. We've completely lost our reason to exist. So I want to consider this question, why church, and provide four answers. The church is necessary because of the great corruption. That's going to be our subject this morning. The church is necessary because of the great commandment. The church is necessary because of the great commission. And then we are... The church is necessary because of the great construction. We'll look at each of those individually over the next four weeks. But what do I mean by the great corruption? By this phrase, 
I am identifying the root causes of the tragedies, the traumas, and the terror that afflict our world. While many of the experts are scratching their heads and wondering why things are the way they are, the church holds the truth that not only states the facts but can set us free. So we begin, the church is necessary because we understand the source of the problem. All of the destruction, all of the disease, all of the death, that we witness in our world cannot be blamed on genetics, cannot be blamed on our environment, cannot be blamed on a lack of educational or economic opportunities. The root cause is much deeper, and it goes all the way back to the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, that familiar story that takes place in the Garden of Eden, The serpent comes to the first man and woman, tempts Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit, and in verse 6 it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Both of them rebelling against God, breaking the one commandment that he gave them and brought into existence, into the created world, sin. At that awful moment, the original couple yielded to temptation. Sin entered and contaminated the human bloodstream. Sin intercepted innocence and ruined it leaving mankind alienated from God. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, even relationally, human beings began deteriorating until death swallowed up life, the ultimate separation. And that's where all of our troubles began. This explains the violence, the treachery, the addictions, the hopelessness of our age. Even natural disasters like that earthquake in Japan finds its root cause in sin. I'm not suggesting that the people of Japan deserved it more than anybody else. No, what I'm saying is in Genesis chapter 3, even the planet is cursed because of mankind's sin. So even the natural disasters that take place are a result of that original sin. We live in a cursed planet We ourselves are infected by sin. Paul explains the progression of sin through all humanity. In Romans chapter 5, I'm going to read just excerpts of verses 12 to 21. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. The many died by the trespass of the one man. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. By the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. The result of the trespass was condemnation for all men. Through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. One act affected all of humanity affected even the world in which we live. That is why the world is in such a mess. Sin is our greatest problem because it separates us from God, the one we were designed to know and to enjoy. But you know, in another sense, the truth about sin is also our greatest insight because we now understand why we are the way we are. Bernard Ram writes in his book, Offense to Reason, apart from works on Christian theology and preaching, the word sin has been dropped from our common conversation. One reason is that the word has suffered an inflation of meanings. Another more important reason is that a secularized culture 
and a secularized educational system tends to avoid theological terms. And because our secularized culture doesn't want to hear about sin, many secularized churches and their secularized preachers don't preach about it. The words of 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, ring tragically true. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Folks, we are seeing that in our culture more and more. People wonder, where did all of this insanity come in that we are dealing with in our culture? People don't know who they are. They think they can make up their identities. They can just choose to be whatever they want to be. Where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came a few decades ago when we decided that truth no longer exists. That everybody can make up their own truth and it's valid. I used to use as an example, if a teacher in school put on the board two plus two equals and every student had their own answer, they would be considered correct. That's exactly what's happening. If that's what you think it is, then it's true for you, and we must accept that. Why? Because there is no truth. We've thrown it away as a culture. When there is no truth, there is no basis. But sadly, some churches and some preachers who identify as Christians have done the same thing. A generation ago, it was Robert Schuller. Today, it's Joel Osteen. They don't want to talk about sin. Why? Because people don't want to hear it. And so they preach their sappy, feel-good messages that pack the seats in their expansive arenas. But they have done so at the expense of the truth. The late Francis Schaeffer called this phenomenon the great evangelical disaster which he describes as the failure of the evangelical church to stand for truth as truth. He succinctly summarized the situation this way. There is only one word for this, accommodation. The evangelical church has accommodated to the world spirit of the age. First, there has been an accommodation on scripture so that many who call themselves evangelicals hold a weakened view of the Bible and no longer affirm the truth of all the Bible teaches. Truth not only in religious matters, but also in the areas of science, and history, and morality. As part of this, many evangelicals are now accepting the higher critical methods in the study of the Bible. And second, there has been an accommodation on the issues with no clear stand being taken ever on matters of life and death. Sadly, that has become the case. In a world that is searching for answers, the church has become silent. Because, going back to my opening statement, when we misdiagnose the problem, our solution doesn't work. And if we're not going to talk about sin, if we're afraid we're going to offend somebody, and so we're not going to talk about the problem, there is no solution. But the church of Jesus Christ knows the truth. We know why we're in the shape that we're in. And until we stand up and start saying it, and still until we start insisting on getting back to truth, the solution will never, ever come about. If a person wants to carry on a thoughtful and responsible conversation on the great disorders and the fractures, not only of personal psyche, but of corporate humanity, what term do we use? If we won't talk about sin anymore, what are we going to call it? And what we have found is a whole lot of other theories out there that are just so much hot air. They have no truth. And where there is no truth, there is no hope. 
politicians, scientists, educators, mental health experts, they can talk hope all they want, but if there is no truth, there is no hope. Unless we get the diagnosis right, there is no solution. But as the church, we understand the source of the problem, and the source is sin. Not only that, but the church understands the severity of the problem. One of the most sweeping, broad brush statements in all of scripture on how depraved we really are as human beings. You see in Genesis chapter six and verse five, it's in the context of Noah and the ark. It says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. (laughs) Did you catch those words? Every inclination, only evil all the time. That's pretty bad. You know, it's kind of a good description of what our world is, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying that human beings are not incapable of doing good things. I'm sure you can all list people who don't go to church, don't believe in God, and yet behave better than a lot of people who do. How can that be? And the answer is this. We're all created in the image of God. And while sin has marred that image, it hasn't destroyed it. So human beings are still capable of doing good things and even loving things. But at the heart of the problem is sin. Even from childhood, this is true. A number of years ago, the Minnesota Crime Commission released this statement. Understand, this is not some Bible thumper. This is a government agency who, by the way, would never get away with putting anything out like this today. Every baby starts out as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny him these, and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness that would be murderous if he weren't so helpless. He is, in fact, dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, give in free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up to be a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist. Did you catch that? Every child. Now, we're not all the same. Every individual has a unique personality. I believe every individual has a unique sin nature. We all have different temptations that are harder for us to overcome. And that's why it's so important that we don't judge people who sin differently than we do, because sin is still sin. We may not sin like they do, but we sin as they do, and we're all in that same boat together. The deadliest killer of human beings is not heart disease, it's not cancer, it's not violence, it's not addiction, it's sin. (laughs) Because the wages of sin is death. And we've all sinned, therefore we all die. Sin is the problem. And to make it worse, we pass it on to every generation. King David understood this in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Now, really pay attention to verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. See, David's not blaming his 
background, his education, the fact that he was, grew up poor, he didn't have all of the benefits of wealth. He's not looking for somebody to blame. He points the finger right back at himself. I am sinful. I've been sinful even before I was born. I was born with that nature. We pass it on from generation to generation. You see, if we are completely determined chemically or physiologically or psychologically or sociologically, sin evaporates. But in a culture that doesn't want to acknowledge sin, doesn't want to talk about sin, we try to find the answers everywhere else. And we ignore the truth. The Bible teaches us that sin is a choice. Yes, we're born with a sin nature, but sin itself is a choice to do something my way instead of God's way. Now, much of our secular society tries to excuse sin or blame it on someone else, you know, the environment, genetics, whatever. I think the world's motto is, it's not your fault. Sometime, if you're ever watching television, especially scripted shows, see how many times you hear, oh, it's not your fault. It's amazing how many times you hear that over and over and over. Or, oh, you couldn't help it. Or, I couldn't help it. That's the mentality of the world. But the scriptural stand on sin more closely resembles the classic cartoon in which the character Pogo says, we have met the enemy and he is us. (laughs) That's the reality. We are our own worst enemy. Because we... Let me make that personal. I am a sinner. And unless I acknowledge that and address that, nothing's going to change. But there's a glimmer of hope in that fact. If sin is a choice, then it's possible to choose not to sin. And that, my friends, is very empowering. See, that's a word that is used a lot in our culture. We want to empower people, right? But you don't empower people by making them a victim. If you convince people that it's not your fault and you couldn't help it, if you tell someone caught in addiction that they have a disease and they need cured, they're not going to be able to help themselves. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that you can't have help along the way. But the bottom line is, the way we get into bad habits and addictions is by making bad choices. And there's only one way out, and that's making good choices. You can have people support you. You can have people educate you. You can have people there to help you, but the bottom line is you've got to choose not to do what got you into that mess. And I heard someone not that long ago who has battled addictions, and he said it so plainly, I about fell out of my chair. He said, I went to the doctor who gave me some pills, and I thought I was cured. He said, it wasn't until I realized that I had to stop saying yes to the addiction that I could gain victory over it. That's the truth, but that's a truth that you're not hearing out in the world. And so we actually have not only the source of the problem, not only the severity of the problem, we also have the solution to the problem. And that's the good news. We are sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. But there is a solution. If we were to end this message right now, it would be depressing. It would be hopeless. But that's not the end. We understand the solution to the problem. 
Thankfully, the biblical stand on sin doesn't end with its existence. The Christian doctrine on sin adds a necessary element to human understanding. Declares that every person is a sinner. Without this knowledge, we lack a fundamental ingredient in our own self-understanding. Knowing we are sinners means that we can then understand our relationship to God. We can understand why we do the things we do. And I love the way Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. Remember him? In Luke 15, 17, it says, he came to his senses. I love that. I think the King James says he came to himself. Same idea. Came to his senses. The light bulb went on. And he says, I don't have to settle for this. I don't have to eat pig slop and live with the pigs. I can go home. My father's slaves live better than this. But he had to come to that realization that it was up to him to make a change. Nobody was going to come and change his situation for him. He had to get up. He had to go home. And until we have that light bulb experience, we're not going to do anything to improve our situation. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know and comprehend the depths of our problem. But the Bible does. The Bible clearly points out what the problem is. In the words of Warren Wearsby, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And until the heart is changed by grace, society will not change at all. And this is why passing new laws doesn't make a difference. This is why pouring money into our problems doesn't change things because we haven't dealt with the problem of the heart. All we're doing is trying to dress up the outside and the inside is rotten. And it's going to continue to be rotten until someone can change us from the inside out. And this is where the church comes in because we know who can do that. We have the answer. We have the solution to the sin problem. Jesus Christ has come. He has defeated sin. He has conquered death. And he has given us hope. I will come in. I will take your sin. I will give you my Holy Spirit so that you can do the right things instead of the wrong things. I can change you from the inside out. And that is something that no government program, no legislation, no medication can do for us. We have the truth. And now more than ever, we need to stand for the truth. Quit giving in to the world. Quit letting them set the narrative and establish the vocabulary. We need to go back to telling the truth. Actually, we need to go back to standing for the fact that there is truth to tell. And I know it's not easy. I'm sure this message is not easy to listen to. Nobody wants to look at a cute baby and say it's a savage. That's not easy. That's not going to go over well out there. I don't recommend that if you have a member of your family with a new baby, you go up and say, oh, what a little savage. Probably won't go over well. But we do have to stand for the truth. At some point, we have got to let people know, here's the problem, and here's the solution. Sometimes we only stop with the problem and we judge people. That's easy to do. But that's not complete. We need to go on and tell them the solution. Redemption is, in Christ is predicated on a de definite theology of sin. To undermine the theology of sin is to undermine redemption. Just so long as we deny the reality of sin, we cut ourselves off from the possibility of being redeemed. C.S. Lewis put it this way, 
a recovery of the old sense of sin is essential to Christianity. Christ takes it for granted that people are bad. Until we really feel this assumption of his to be true, though we are a part of the world he came to save, we're not a part of the audience to whom his words are addressed. We lack the first condition for understanding what he's talking about. If we reject the idea of sin, we remove the possibility for a solution. But too many churches are doing it. Too many churches are getting sucked into the, I want to be liked, I want to be followed, I want to fill my seats with people, so I'm going to tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. If you had a doctor that ran a bunch of tests and sat you down and said, the news isn't good, you got a terminal disease. Would you like that news very much? Probably not. But what if he sat you down and said, all clear, looks good, you're good for years, and you're not? Would you be happy with that? No. You may not want to hear what the truth is, but you do want to hear the truth, right? We can't do any less as the church we need to stand on the truth but let's not stop with the problem let's not stop with the source and the severity of the problem let's also go to the solution and though that passage from Romans 5 that was read earlier had a lot of negative it also had the truth Romans 5 17 acknowledges for if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Yes, sin is real. Yes, sin is devastating. Yes, sin brings death. Yes, sin is the cause of all of the problems we have in our world, but there is a solution, and the solution is Jesus Christ. That is where we have hope. So we need to correctly diagnose the problem, and then we have to correctly prescribe the solution. That's why church is necessary, because you're not going to hear this in the government. You're not going to hear this in the schools. You're not going to hear this in the hospitals and in the mental health clinics. You're not going to hear it in the media. If we don't stand for this truth, who will? I'll tell you, no one. It is up to us. We are necessary because of the great corruption of mankind that has gripped us, but there's also a great salvation that is available. We must be faithful to the truth that can set people free, because it really can.